Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, if you would, turn to the 11th Psalm. My greetings to you now, if I haven't shaken your hand or said hello. Welcome to Bible Believers. Glad to have you here. All the children that occupied so many seats, so we leave open seats. You can squeeze in. Everyone's back row, right? Back row Baptist. But you can squeeze up closer if you'd like. Just saying. Uh, the 11th Psalm. We've got a new series after 32 weeks of uh, trying to heal our hearts. Hopefully the Word of the Lord has ministered to your heart in some way, shape, or form over the last 32 weeks. And now he's going to have to, we're going to have to lean on the Lord to do some work on our hearts doctrinally, to teach us some things. So the new series is now, not what we'd like to do, what I'd like to do is lay some foundations of our biblical faith. And with as many new faces as we've had uh, in recent times, I want to make sure that you understand what the Bible teaches um, about everything that it teaches, of course, though we won't have the time to do that in this series. Uh, that's a lifetime of learning. But to basically take, I've got a discipleship book. I didn't bring it with me here. It's a white book that's out on the shelf there. Very milky, uh, good doctrine, but milky, just very light for Christians, very newborn babes. What I hope to do is to take that kind of as our foundation and build upon it so that when we're done, we'll have maybe a two or three hundred page book that we can use to in depth disciple people. So maybe we bring them from the milk to the meat. That's the point. Uh, and then I want to start giving you some meat. Not today. Today you can relax. Remember, you know, there's only going to be a few verses, but we are going to go to school. All right, that is my intent. We are going to go to school. Psalm 11, verse 3. I want us to look there. And I hope not to bore you. I will still be the same, you know, um, charismatic and anger-driving um, person that I am. Uh, I use charismatic sarcastically. Anger-driving, yes, that often happens. But Psalm 11, verse 3 says... Brother Joe, will you read that out for us, please? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? It's good to have someone else say the verse, you know. This way you know that I'm not just, it's not just in my Bible, I'm not just making it up. Someone else sees it too. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. Right? Well, that's a good question to ask, but we need to pray, and then we'll, we'll, we'll begin to talk about this. Father, uh, help us to see everything that we need to see. I don't know how long this series is going to go. Uh, I do pray that it would be good for the people. Lord, there's people that have been uh, saved for a lot of years and understand the things that I will be teaching. I pray that it wouldn't, um, um, I guess, be boring to them. Um, but Lord, my, my heart right now is on so many new faces that we have here. Uh, Lord, uh, that I, I kind of want to surround them all and compass them about with uh, compassion and uh, with good Bible doctrine. And so I pray that you would uh, maybe give the spirit of patience to um, those who have been through all this and have heard these doctrines many, many times. And uh, for those who haven't, Lord, I pray that we would clear up any and all confusion about what the Bible actually teaches. We ask it now in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, Psalm 11.3 says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So the verse mentions the righteous because, as it were, only the righteous actually care about whether or not the foundations are destroyed. That's the intent of the verse. If you weren't righteous, you wouldn't care. And in fact, it would be an unrighteous thing to destroy the foundations. Intentional or not, and hear that, please. Because there are a lot of people that teach a lot of different things and don't mean to teach falsely. Think they've got it right, and they're trying to intend to teach the Bible correctly. This is the truth. We've got some people who teach that a man is saved by good works. We've got others that teach that a man is saved by getting water baptized. We've got others that teach that men are saved by enduring until the end of their lives. Others teaching that men are saved by eating wafers and confessing to priests. Is that not true? Well, what do I believe? 
What should I believe? What is truth? These are all religious men claiming to be Christians. So what do I do? And that's just the doctrine of salvation. And I've left a whole lot of other things out that people teach. What about rapture? Is there a rapture? Do you know what the rapture is? Are you hoping for the rapture? Do you believe it's coming in your day? Is it pre-trib or post-trib? What's the trib? <laughs> Are we King James only? Non-King James only? Do we speak in tongues? Do we not speak in tongues? Are we dispensational? Are we non-dispensational? You say, I don't even know what that means. Okay, well, that's why I'm doing this series. Amen. That's the point. Uh, Job said in Job 10 and verse 15, he said, I am full of confusion. And I think he's echoing the modern church. The modern church is full of confusion. And, and I hope, by the grace of God, to clear up the confusion, not because I have everything right, but because I believe the Bible. And I, I believe so much in this book that as long as I can study to show myself approved and get the context of the verses, that I believe I can have at least a basic understanding of a particular doctrine. And I think the further I study, and the further I get the context of the verses, I will know more, and I will know more. And the more I want to know, the more the Holy Spirit of God will want to teach me. Amen. And the moment I say that this is all I need to know and no more, the Holy Spirit says, okay, well, then I won't teach you anymore. That's all on us. How much do you want to know? I don't know. There's, you know, I think of Ron. Ron does carpentry work. Well, how much carpentry work do you know? How much do you want to know? You don't have to answer that. I'm just saying. <laughs> right? How much doctrine does a doctor need to know? How much mechanics does a car mechanic need to know? How much do you need? To, how much do you want to know? How much further do you want to go? Okay, well, how much of a Christian should I be? How much of a Christian do you want to be? Amen. Well, I wish I knew the Bible like that guy. Well, how much do you study? It doesn't, this isn't osmosis. <laughs> you actually got to read it. I wish it worked that way. Just use it as my pillow at night, right? <laughs> so let's, let's hope to clear up some confusion uh, it will be your job, as I teach, it'll be your job, and this would be, and any Bible-believing pastor would teach this. It'll be my job to show you what the Bible says. It'll be your job to discern whether or not I am teaching in accordance to it. That's your job. For however many weeks we do this, hmm, pastor just said that. Let me look at this. And that's okay. Judge away. Judge away. I'm open book. We're good. Um, and if it, and if it I, let me say this, if you've done that, and it lines up with the Bible, what I've taught, follow it. Right. Don't question it, don't go, but I don't like this, or what, follow it. Amen. And it has nothing to do with me, it has to do with you and your walk with the Lord. Because if it's true and it's substantiated by the Bible, we ought to do it. If it doesn't, well then don't. And don't care about what I say. Well, I disagree with you. Okay, well, if the Bible disagrees with me too, then you don't have to worry about what I've taught. But I'm wrong. It's right. And I'll admit that. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. The book's right. So what do you believe? I don't know. What does the book say? No, but what do you believe? What does the book say? That's what I believe. In its context. Well, surely you don't believe all of it. Every last word. Amen. Now, historically, the main service of a church is reserved for a more inspirational message, which is what we've done over the last however many weeks. Um, but I'm going to ask you to go to school. Okay? We willing? Yeah. yeah. Ho hopefully, it w hopefully this will be a school you want to attend, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> nobody wants to go to school. Much study is a weariness to the flesh. That's what the scripture says. And we're going to do much study. So you may come in here and go, Ugh. but that's your flesh. That's not your born again man, that's your flesh. Yeah. Say, Ugh. Your spirit man should want to know everything the Bible has to say. Amen. All right. First Timothy.
Oh, I already gave you that verse. Brother, I still don't know what I'm doing with slides here. One of these days I'll get it right. That's what happens when I do too much free form. Don't look at the notes, start talking, I forget to hit the slides. So, First Timothy, this is an epistle to a, a young pastor, as far as we know, unmarried, no children. Say, so, wait a minute, I thought pastors all had to be uh, married with children. Um, no, elders should be. Wait a minute, isn't a pastor and an elder the same thing? Mm, no. But I've always been taught it was. Well, that, that'll be one of the things we discuss. One of the many, many, many things we discuss. An elder is an elder person. And, there, and, and Timothy, as a pastor, was meant to ordain him. But that's a whole side note. Um, this is a pa uh, an epistle to a young pastor, delivered by Paul, but given by inspiration of God. Okay, so this, God's talking to Timothy. That's what, this is how much I believe the Bible. When I open up the Bible, I believe God is talking. Amen. Now, when I pray, I'm talking to God. But when He talks to me, it's through the book. And outside of that, I would question anything. Yeah. Well, God told me, He told you what? Well, I had this impression. This impression, this impression to do what? Well, to do complete opposite of what Timothy teaches me. Oh. <laughs> And that's God? Oh, I'm absolutely positive this was God. You know, okay, well, if God's the one you look at in the morning in the mirror, then you, I'm positive with you that was God talking. God will never go against His Word. Amen. Not ever, ever, ever. So, 1 Timothy 6, verse 13 says, I give thee, that's the young pastor, charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. What does all of that mean? That means that Jesus Christ stood before Pontius Pilate, and the witness he gave of himself was the good confession. Okay? Uh, but God says to Timothy, the pastor, I give thee charge. That's an, that's an order, right? You heard the military, charge, right? Back in the Civil War days or whatever. I don't know, you did the reenactment, Tom. Did they do that? Charge! Was that part of it? They that. Yeah, they did that? Okay. Uh, verse 14. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, which commandment? Well, I don't know. Based on the context, it's the end of the chapter. It could be everything that he's been commanded throughout the book of 1 Timothy. Or that command which is to follow. Either way, you've got to keep the command which is to follow. So let's look at it. Verse 15. Oh, a little side note here. Verses 15 and 16. Side note. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, capital P, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only... Only, Jesus only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Amen. So just reminding Timothy that Jesus will return. Here's a few things that he reminded him. Jesus is going to return. When Jesus returns, he will be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is immortal and can grant immortality to anyone he wishes to grant immortality unto. He is the light, and there in him is no darkness at all. He is to be honored. Amen. That's just, he's just reminding Timothy, listen, I want, just, just to let you know, again, who's really in charge. Because I'm giving you a charge, and I'm going to ask you to be in charge of all these people, but I want you to know who really is in charge. And every pastor would do well to remember that. Your greatest giver in the church is not who's in charge. Deacons are not in charge. Elders are not in charge. Pastors are not in charge. God is in charge. How? By the governing of His Word. Amen. And if it goes outside of that, well, then we're in trouble. That's when men do all things that they want to do and whatever they want to do, and it becomes a mess. Uh, da -da -da, verse 17. Charge them, charge them now, the people you are pastoring, that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So teach the people that they are not to trust in the substance of their back pockets. Teach people humility. Teach them to trust Jesus, not the fruit of their labor. 
all part of the verse, verse 18. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Now, this is all side note stuff, but just teach, teach people to be good. Uh, but you're so judgmental. But I've got to teach you to do good. But don't judge me. Teach them to work. Why is the pastor always asking us to do stuff? Because I was told to teach you to work. Amen. Teach them to give. Uh-oh, now we're in trouble. <laughs> I hate it. All they do is talk about money. That's not all we do around here at Bible Believers, and you know that's true if you've attended here long enough, but I am told to teach you to give. And money's just part of it. Teach them to communicate. Oh, I just want to come to church, and I just want to sit in the back row, and I don't want to talk to anybody, and I don't want to shake their hands, and I just want to leave. Well, I've got to teach you to communicate. <laughs> None of that was my point. Here's my point, verse 19. Laying up in store for themselves a good what? A good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. What in context do you suppose that means the time to come? I'll tell you what, in your personal life, any trial or tribulation, doctrinally, the tribulation. I, and, and, so, so what do we have here? Do you see what's at stake for laying a good foundation in a church? Souls. There will be people in, in the attendance of any church, a, a born-again Christian church, but people in attendance of a born-again Christian church that do not know the Lord. You don't, I don't know what you believe. You can tell me with your lips, but I don't know for sure. I can't see your soul. I can't see your heart. I can't see your faith unless you make it abundantly clear to me. That's James chapter 2. Another side note. But anyone in this room right now, I mean, there could be five people not saved, ten people not saved. I don't know. I don't know. So why is it so important that I lay good foundation? So that you will be. It doesn't matter how much you go to church. Your soul matters. Where you're going to spend eternity matters. I want you to go to church. God wants you to go to church. But if you just go to church and play religion week in and week out and then go to hell after, what was the point? You should have stayed home and slept in and watched the Bills game. God isn't interested in your religion. He wants your heart. He wants you to want Him. Verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, Falsely so-called. How about that? 2,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit of God said, science is going to oppose you. Oh, and by the way, it's falsely so-called because it's not real science. How about that? It's almost as if God knew that they would teach evolution. Oh, wait a minute, he did. <laughs> so he says to Timothy, avoid the profane conversation. Stay away from the babblings of the religious and the superstitious. Forget what uh, the uh, fake scientists and the college educated have to say. And keep that which I committed to your trust. Do you see what he's saying? Timothy, I'm trusting you to keep this. That means something. When God is saying, this is my eternal word, I am entrusting you, young man, 20s, 30s, I don't know, he was a young man, with the words of life that will lead souls to heaven or hell. Amen. Yeah. What's the big deal? We got a church fellowship after, right? I'm joking. I'm asking facetiously. Oh, <laughs> Debbie Bott had a heart attack over there. <laughs> We're going bowling after, right? Yeah. 
We've got some fun times coming after, right? Just, this is what people are thinking when they think of church. And how God's looking at it is, I've trusted the pastor, not with the ball game, not with the fellowships, not with this calendar and that calendar, though the pastors are always stuck with that stuff, but with the words of eternal life. Amen. I'm giving that to you. You need to keep that charge. Okay? All right. Look at verse 21. Which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. It's saying that some are not going to keep the oracles of God. Some will have strayed from the truth. Do you see there in the text that this notion that as long as you believe in something, you're okay, it's not correct because you can err in the faith. Not just err in faith, err in the faith. What the faith? The faith once delivered. People can start to stray and not understand. Well, how is a man saved? Am I saved? Am I eternally saved? Is eternal security right? I don't know what's going on. Back and forth, back and forth. Well, what are the leaders, what have they kept? What have your leaders kept? What are your leaders teaching you? They better be. Or that's why, oh, I don't know if I'm going to keep my salvation. Oh, I don't know if this is true. I don't know if this doctrine. I don't know if that doctrine. And back and forth, the saints are so confused. And they're so confused because the pastors spend more time reading books about the Bible than they do reading the Bible. And that is the truth, and I know it's the truth. I went to Bible Institute. I watched as all the guys in the back row talked about, you know, the, guy, the back row. Let me explain the back row. Was the, the back row is the back row. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of like this back row. <laughs> it was the cat's meow of the Bible Institute. You guys are feeling pretty left out right about now, aren't you? No, they sat in the back, and that's what, like, the graduates or the ones that were getting ready to graduate, uh, the high and the honchos, and, you know, and they all felt high about themselves, and they'd pass around the books that they were reading, and I'd sit there and go, go sit in the front row. I couldn't stomach it because it was always this book and that book and I'm reading this and I'm reading that and then in the institute they're saying, what book should every pastor read other than the Bible? What should he read? The Purpose Driven Church and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And this promulgation of all these books and these ideas and I wondered where's Jesus in any of it? When does his word get to take precedent in the lives of those who are supposed to be entrusted with it? We actually had a young man in homiletics class stand up to a pulpit. Maybe this doesn't mean anything to you. It meant, it meant the world to me. He came up and delivered a message and didn't bring his Bible to the pulpit. Wow. He had his notes and his outline and he spoke eloquently. And I, where is the book? At least the guys who were in charge of the class said that, you know what, never go to the pulpit without your Bible. That's like a no-no. You know, I, I, my book's open. I more hold it up than I do actually turn the pages. They're all in my notes. But I want you to know where my notes came from. You know, this is about understanding what my job is. Okay? All right. <laughs> Um, but you can err in the faith, and that's all about whether or not a leader has kept the faith. This is about keeping the foundations in order. Now listen, I'm no builder. I can't swing a hammer to save my life. If you put a hammer in my hands, I may hurt myself and somebody else. I'm just no, I'm no good at it. But I do understand that the worst thing that can happen to a building is for it to have foundational trouble. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians 3. And verse 9. Says, For we 
are laborers, talking to the saints. We are laborers together with God, right? You're supposed to do something for the Lord. Amen. You're not just supposed to come to church. You're supposed to do something for God. Ye are God's husbandry. What does that mean? You're a vineyard. A husbandman would have, be someone who plants a vineyard. Okay? You are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. You're his building. Save person. You're his building. This isn't God's building. You're his building. Okay? So you see it. You are the building of God. How's your foundation? Got cracks? Water damage? How's your foundation? Do you see what else you are? God's husbandry. You're, you're his field. You're his vineyard. Watch this now. Go to Proverbs 24. This is what's so great about the Bible. One verse will lead you down another thought. And they all work together. And the moment you get a Bible verse that does this with another Bible verse, you know that you're not dealing with the same subject matter. That'll help you in your study. If it seems opposed to another verse, it's not the same subject. Okay? Proverbs 24, verse 30. I went by the field of the slothful. That's almost every American. His backyard, right? I went by the field of the slothful, and by the vineyard, there it is, right? You are God's husbandry, right? By the vineyard of the man void of understanding. Do you know who doesn't keep the foundations of a field? What's the verse say? A sluggard. A slothful man. The lazy. The man who shrugs when you show him a Bible verse revealing his error. Eh, so. And what suffers? The vineyard. You're the vineyard. Verse 31. And lo, it, the vineyard, was all grown over with thorns and nettles and covered the face thereof and the stone wall thereof was broken down. What are thorns and nettles associated with? For those who know the Bible. Sin. It's a part of the sin curse. Go back to Genesis chapter 3. So it's connected to the sin. You didn't have thorns and weeds and nettles and things growing like that in the earth until Adam and Eve sinned and the earth was cursed. How's your vineyard? See, if you've got thorns and nettles growing up in it, you know what's growing in your vineyard. Sin. I don't like this series already, Pastor. Are you covered with thorns? Are you uninhabitable? Are you unable to produce? So what happened? Sin happened. How's your foundation? Verses 32, 33, and 34. Then I saw and considered it well... So now some wisdom is going to come. Some wisdom takes a look at this field and says, now I'm going to consider. This is all inspiration of God. This is the Holy Spirit speaking here. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. So what happened? Someone slept when they should have been awake and sober. Someone closed their eyes when they should have been watching. Which somebody? Well, who's supposed to watch the field? Who watches over the sheep? What's he watching for? Wolves. Which means wolves can enter into the sheepfold. What do you want the shepherd to do when the wolves enter in? Let's take him bowling. <laughs> That's what most pastors would want. Let's bring him to lunch. Well, how do I know what a wolf is? Well, I'll know the moment they start opening their mouths. Start tearing down everything we believe in? That's a wolf. 
What do you expect your pastor to do? What? <laughs> Verbal assault from your pastor. <laughs> Uh, I've gotten pretty verbal with some people that came in here trying to tear up the church. Amen. There was one man in that back corner. I looked at him and I said, get behind me, Satan. He, he was stunned out of his mind that I said that to him. Because he came in here just trying to tear everything up. Came in after service. Not during service. Didn't join us. Came in after wanting to tear up. Do you believe this? Do you believe that? Do you be oh, you're wrong. You're wrong. You're wrong. And I just said, you know what? Get out of here, Satan. I know what your devices are. You can come in here, stir things up, get out of here. And he's like, I'm a Christian. Why are you calling me Satan? I said, so was Peter. You can be a Christian and speak for the devil. That's the Bible. How, and what's going to make me start speaking for the devil instead of speaking for God? When I stop speaking this. Ephesians chapter 5. This is all very preachy stuff, make you feel bad, you know, dislike me for a little while. And then it's all for the purpose of laying a foundation to the series to come. Most of this is going to be studious. And it'll be delivered, you know, in my way. So you'll probably still get angry with me. But... Um, this is more preachy for today. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Wherefore he saith, now we're talking about right, the church here, Ephesians, right? Written to the church? Okay. Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. Wait a minute, I'm already saved. I'm already risen from the dead. Right. You're missing the context. He's not telling you to get saved again. He's saying you're saved, but you act like a dead person. Wake up. Christ shall give thee light. See, no, that's my salvation. No, no, that's this. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You already have the light of salvation, but now you've got to wake up and you've got to see what path am I on? Where am I? I'm walking in this Christian life. I don't know where I'm at. Everything's dark. Why is it dark? Because you didn't bring your book. See then that you walk circumspectly. What does that word mean? Let's go to school. Let's go to school. Circum, the root of circumference. Spect, the root of spectacle. I see spectacle all the way around, circumference. It means to be paying attention to all of your surroundings. That's what the word circumspect means. So, see then that ye walk circumspectly. Not as fools, which would be this. Well. But as wise, which would be this. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. You go back to that story of the men that lapped up the water. You know that Lord would give victory to Gideon? By what army? Well, we got lots of guys. Yeah, I'm going to start weeding, weeding it down. And it came right down to the men who drink. And there were some that got down into the water like this. And they began to drink like a dog. God says, yeah, I don't want them. Or not like a dog, I should say. They just stuck their head in the water. This is the problem. You can't see when you're like this. But he said, but those who reach in the water like this and drink, those are the guys I want. So now, here's the water. Face in here, not paying attention to what's around me, or... That's a pastor's job. That's your job. Okay? See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Someone has to watch. Someone has to keep 
the old paths. They've got to be maintained. It's a path. Have you ever been down, like, you've been, like, out in the forest or out in the woods or whatever, and there are paths that deer leave? But if they stop traveling that path, what happens? It gets grown over. We're talking about an old path. I need an old path, and I need to see on that old path. So here's my lantern, and hopefully it's not all grown over with nettles and thorns. We've got to keep them. Trimming, shovel, pull a rock out of the way. We don't want anybody to stumble. Get that stone out of there. Someone has to keep an eye on the foundation of the building to make sure the building remains viable for generations to come. Another generation is going to walk that path after we're gone, church. If, if the Lord tarries, there's another generation. They need to walk that path. Keep the path. They're going to want to enjoy the building. Let's keep the building. And I don't just mean this. Keep it. This foundation's too important to let it just crumble. Walls will come down. Much like, if you noticed, in the field of the slothful, there was a wall around the vineyard that was broken down and crumbled. Now, may I turn your attention to those pillars? See them? <laughs> Don't notice that the N up here is upside down. We'll just cover that. <laughs> it took me a while to notice that. That's actually upside down. But that's uh, my perfection nature looking at it going, well, really? Do we really have to do that? Uh, but Jacob and Boaz, right? They, don't be fooled. If you, if you were to go and Google Jacob and Boaz, which a few people have done, all you're going to get is this esoteric Masonic Lodge stuff. Okay? So what's happened is that the Masons have stolen this idea of Jacob and Boaz and have turned it into an occult practice. That's okay. God, you know, what I mean by that is not okay, but that doesn't make the real Jacob and Boaz wrong. Okay, there will be an anti-Christ that doesn't make Jesus Christ wrong. There's an anti-Jacob and Boaz that doesn't make Jacob and Boaz wrong. So, well, I don't even know what Jacob and Boaz is. All right, well, that's what we're doing today, right? I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 3. We've had these pillars on display uh, only in this building, but since 2008 when we started this church, the pillars have been on display spiritually. Uh, and people have asked me over the years what it means, and here I want to teach it. Verse 15, 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 15 says, let's, I still hear pages turning, go ahead, take your time. Get there. Verse 15, chapter 3. Also, he made before the house, we're talking about now the house of God, the temple, two pillars of 30 and 5 cubits high. The chapter was on the top of each of them, uh, was five cubits. And he made chains, as in the oracle, and put them on the heads of the pillars, and made an hundred pomegranates, and put them on the chains. And you're like, I don't even understand that. This is just all descriptions of these pillars, and the, the top, which would be the chapter of the pillar, and then the, the decorations of the pillar. In verse 17, and he reared up the pillars before the temple, one on the right hand and the other on the left, and he called the name of, that was on the right hand, Jachin. And the name of, that was on the left was Boaz. So now it's a curious thing because right and left are very subjective. Because as I'm looking at it, you're like, it's on the left. Yeah, but it's the right hand, of, right hand side of the building. See what I'm saying? As I'm looking at it on the left. That's how I understand it anyhow. So it actually, in the way we read, that puts Jacob first and then Boaz, okay? I could be wrong, could be the other, not that that matters much. So now you at least see where the idea comes from. We've got two pillars in the house of God, and now you know why we've got two pillars here with Jacob and Boaz. So, well, what's the point? Well, since 2008, I have been teaching 
that words mean things. Okay? And because God is an author, he authored one great book made up of 66 mini books, and only 66. Uh, but because he's an author, he takes very special care with words. And they mean something, and that's why you can't just mess with them and replace words at your liking. That's what modern versions do. Say, are we going to talk about that? Oh, yeah, that's coming real soon. Because we are unapologetically a King James church. Amen. That will remain as long as I am the pastor here. And I am not afraid to say that. And I'm not concerned that if you don't believe in that, you know, that you might leave. If you're going to leave, you're going to leave. But we're not going to change. Yeah. Can I say this? And I, and I don't mean, this isn't hurtful. I don't mean it to be hurtful. It all, often comes off that way. You think about this country. We've got a lot of people trying to get into this country, right? Mm -hmm. yep. All the time, trying to get in. Yep. And whether you're, like I said, a donkey or an elephant, uh, this is not the, what I'm talking about. But there's people trying to get in here. And when they get in here, there are those people that have the mindset of, now I'm going to wave the flag of Mexico or the Philippines or Poland or wherever I'm from, and I'm going to wave that as opposed to assimilate themselves into that which the country believes. The country speaks English. We are English-speaking people. Um, not that I'm a big rah-rah flag waver or anything, um, but you know, if I'm going to wave a flag, why would I wave the flag of Germany, even though I'm a German? I'm going to wave the flag of America, because I'm an American. And, and I'm not trying to, and th this is the whole thing about when people come in, they come in with their culture and then try to change the culture of the country to meet the culture that they want it to be. Same thing happens in a church. There is a culture here. This was our culture, Jacob and Boaz, from the beginning. So if somebody comes in here and says, well, I want to be a part of Bible believers. Praise the Lord. Glad you're coming. Come in legally. <laughs> Glad you're here. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't like Jake. And can we take that down? Absolutely not. So don't you care about my feelings? Not as much as I care about our culture. And there's a reason that I have the culture, you know, that we have established, the culture is that we've established. And I don't want it torn down. Are we okay? Right? That doesn't mean I dislike you. But I, I want to maintain the integrity of this church, just like I think this country ought to retain its integrity for what it is and how, what language it speaks, et cetera, et cetera. And you can disagree with me, and that's okay. I still love you, usually. <laughs> Proverbs 25, verse 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. So the God who wrote a book asks you to search out the words of this book like you're digging for buried treasure. I mean, come on, if someone told you there's treasure in your backyard, and you went, where, where, where? I'm not sure, but there's treasure. Wouldn't take long for you to be out there digging, right? I tell you, there's, God tells you there's treasure in his book. Mm. See, because we're after the gold treasure, but we're not after the spiritual treasure. But there is treasure to be found in this book, if you're willing to dig. We're told to study to show ourselves approved unto God. 2 Timothy 2.15. Look at John 5. I want to flip you over there. John chapter 5. And I'm going to explain Jacob and Boaz. I'm leaving you all dangling here for a few minutes. John 5.39. A great key verse on how to study the Old Testament. Jesus said in verse 39, search the scriptures. Well, Romans to Philemon wasn't written. Well, it's eternal, but it wasn't available. Okay? So he, what was he referring to? Genesis to Malachi. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. A lot of religious people thinking they're going to heaven. And they, the scriptures, are they which testify of 
Me. That's what Jesus said. You can't find the name Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. But he said, all of them testify of me. Without revealing the name of Jesus, the Old Testament scriptures continually reveal him to the man that's looking for him. Typologies, similitudes, like buried treasure. Jesus is buried throughout the Old Testament. What do you got to do? You got to be an honorable king. Start digging. So, as you dig through these pillars, the name Jachin means he will establish. The author and finisher of our faith. Is that not Jesus? He's the author, which means he did what? He established the faith. Right? That's Jesus. Let it not be lost on the hearer that Jesus begins with the letter J, as does Jacob. Okay, what does the name Boaz mean? This one's going to be a little tougher for you. It means, as a word, fleetness. F-L-E-E-T-N-E-S-S. -S. Well, what is a fleet? Any old Navy guys out here? Any Navy, former Navy people? No? A fleet of ships? You've heard of that before, right? A fleet would be a grouping of ships. The adjective form of the word means quick and powerful. That registering with anyone. He... Jesus will establish the quick and powerful. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. So Jesus will establish the Bible, and notice it's B and B. Say, man, you're just finding stuff that ain't there. Really? Any mathematicians out there? What are the odds? <coughs> what are the odds? The Lord is hiding things in the Scripture so that you will dig them up. And through it, He's letting you know that the house of God needs to be established on two pillars, Jesus and the Bible. Jachin, He will establish Boaz, the quick and powerful. Church leadership often establishes their own pillars, right? Any church that's begun is begun with a vision. Um, and they are going to hold to that vision, those pillars, um, and erect it as such so that for many generations it will be what they had the vision for it to be. Understand? Unfortunately, particularly in America, those pillars are not often biblical ones. It's just a vision the pastor has, and he can't substantiate it with Bible anywhere. Now, anyone here, this is, the pastor's going to be mean now. Ready? Can you handle it? Any here, anyone here of Rick Warren? Okay. He wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Church, and then followed it up with a book called The Purpose Driven Life. Those books <coughs> lit the Christian, the Christian world up, and everyone began buying them and practicing the principles found within the book. Church people ate it up like candy, and I was told, like I said, in the institute class, in um, our administration class, one of the questions on my final exam was, what book should every pastor read besides the Bible? And the correct answer for the test was the purpose-driven church. I had a great dilemma with that question. Do I get 100 or do I get a 99? I gave him what he wanted and I got my 100. Have I ever read the purpose-driven church? I have. Not to adopt its principles but to know what it teaches. All right, ready? Because I'm talking, we're talking about foundations and we're talking about pillars, right? And you can do what you will with Rick Warren, and you can think what you will of me for thinking what I think of Rick Warren. 
You're free. I'm free. Okay? Here's what his book has to say about pillars. And I quote, Be willing to let people leave the church. And I told you earlier the fact that people are going to leave the church no matter what you do. To that I will agree. But when you define the vision, what does that mean? When you set up pillars, right? You're choosing who leaves. You say, but Rick, yes, they're the pillars of the church. Now, you know what pillars are. Pillars are people who hold things up. And in your church, you may have to have some blessed subtractions before you have any real additions. That's purpose-driven church. So do you see how Mr. Warren is using pillars? Not, not for, like, the apostles were called pillars of the church, meaning they held up the foundation. He's using it as, no, these are the people that hold back progress. That's his book. God sees pillars as foundational. He sees them as a problem. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Warren, but that is a slap in the face of the God who wrote the book. Amen. This book, not that book. Mm -hmm. And it became a false pillar upon which many, many churches were established. All right. So, what are we going to do here in this series to come? We are not going to be afraid to point out that which is false. Did I not already lay that example? Okay? We're going to teach the Bible. Amen. We're going to teach Bible principles. I'm going to teach you how to read the Bible. Uh, we're not going to call upon the rock musicians to entertain us or our little ones. We're not going to fall for all the new fads of the day. We're not going to put Jesus on a new cart or offer a new version of the Word of God that's bigger, better, stronger, faster, and it's not any of those things. So now that we know what the foundations of Bible Believers Church were established to be in 2008, we're going to let Jesus instruct us through His Word about a number of different things, not the least of which will be the doctrine of Christ as it pertains to our salvation. So, Lord willing, next week what I'd like to do is begin with the Bible. And I want to show you a bunch of things from the Bible. I'm going to, you know, we're going to show you, I'll show you some numerology stuff. I'm going to give you some history. I am not, we already did a numerology series, so it's not going to be in-depth. But I'm going to show you how numbers line up in the Bible. I'm going to show you some wonderful things in the Bible. I'm going to give you the history of the King James Bible and the history of all the other Bibles. And you're going to sit in and listen on those classes. You're going to get a history lesson. And you're going to see why we believe what we believe about a book that most of us complain they can't understand, even though it was written on a fifth grade reading level. And when I show you the wonders that are found in the book and found in a King James Bible, I believe it will increase your faith. And when it increases your faith in the book, right, the wonders increase the faith in the book, then the book should be able to relate to you its truths and you will want to believe them because man, oh man, this book is awesome. And that is my intent, is to show you how magnificent the book is before we start digging into the doctrines of the book. Okay? Thoughts? He never asks for thoughts during the regular service. I'm a little nervous to do it myself. All right. You want to go home. Father, thank you um, for this time, Lord, as we, we know that the foundation of every church should be Jesus Christ. He is the chief cornerstone. He's the foundation. Thank you, Lord, for being that for us and, and, and erecting these pillars to be on display of uh, really what we ought to be doing is just putting Jesus and the Bible at the forefront of everything we do, Lord. And, and I thank you for that picture. And I pray that we would never change or veer from that pattern. I pray that we would never look at those pillars as something that holds back progress, 
but rather as something that keeps the building and the, and the ceiling up from collapsing down on us. Lord, thank you for giving us that perfect Bible. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for our sins. We give you all the praise and the glory for who you are, what you've done, and the book you've given. And I pray, Lord, in this series to come that the hearts of the people would be okay with going back to school and learning some things and studying and looking through Bible verses and learning what words mean. Uh, Lord, I pray that that would tickle the fancy of the people here as they fall in love with this book. And Lord, that you'd help us to fall in love with this book so that we might fall in love with the Savior more and more each and every day and a little less in love with ourselves from day to day to day. Uh, we ask now all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.